We'll just leave those here and we'll just count them as... Uh, no. Yes, automatic. All right, we're in, going to be in Galatians chapter 1. I believe we worked our way all the way down to uh, verse 9. may look at verse 8 for just a second. Before we get started, though, we're going to have a prayer. Uh, anybody need anybody mentioned in particular? I know we all have sick lists at our congregations and folks that are going through things. Are you serious? Where's she from? She's in Atlanta. 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 Yeah. Lindy McDowell, Madeline. That is amazing because we had a Henderson. You know Don Henderson from Trenton, Jim? Uh, used to go, his whole family, I guess they were 50% of Glendale 50 years ago. He had like nine siblings. His sister, she had open heart today. And the last name's, his last name's Henderson. I just thought maybe they was related, but not so. Well, boy, I tell you what, that's good. I mean, because nowadays they give you an appointment, it'll be like, you know, 2026 or something. That's, uh, well, I'm glad she's, and she said she's in Atlanta. Let's pray together, shall we? Our Father in heaven, Lord God, we're thankful for this day, this opportunity to be together, thankful for this school, thankful for this class. Father, we pray that as we leave here tonight, that we'll take something that's been said here, we'll spending the time together to study your word and help us to be better students of your word, to be better presenters of your word, to be better teachers, to just be better Christians, Lord. May we learn something, take something from this to help us in our endeavors. We're mindful of those that were mentioned, mindful of loved ones who've had surgeries, especially emergency surgeries, Lord. We pray that all that's been done will uh, expedite their health and she can get back to her much-wanted walks in every day and father we're just so thankful for this avenue that we can petition you knowing that uh, you hear the prayers and that you'll uh, work with us father and work with her and be with those that have administered care to her and make sure she gets the things that she needs to have the greatest benefit we pray all of this in your son's name amen any questions over anything that we talked about last week the book of galatians in general the area that we're talking about. What was the unique thing about the book of Galatians that you can't really say a, about a whole lot of Paul's books? It's rare. He's not in prison. Well, he's not in prison. Well, there you go. Uh, but uh, usually he wrote like uh, Timothy, right? And then sometimes he'd write to Rome. He wrote to the church at Corinth. But what is the book of Galatians? Who's that written to? Multiple congregations, that's right. So it's a whole area. And I started to talk a little bit about this last week and probably needed to, but uh, false teaching has an impact greater than the local congregation. And sometimes when uh, things are going on, it's good that brethren have an idea and understanding of what the error is. And the more specific that we can be, the easier it is to, uh, for people to say, okay, that's not something I want to be participating in and uh, know that that's, that's where that's taking place and, uh, you know, let folks know who's doing what. Now, that way, uh, Paul's going to be saying, these Judaizers, you know, oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? These people are really hurting the churches in the Galatia area. Uh, you know, we said... Who lives in Galatia? Do we remember who, who, what's it named after? The Gauls. And what are the Gauls, what are they ultimately, where did they come from? Yeah, the Celtics, man, the French. And like, what are y'all doing over here, you know? But, you know, they came across that little Helen spot. And, uh, you know, they were just rape, pillaging, and plundering. They were kind of like uh, the Vikings, if you will. And what's amazing is that France was just about put back into the Stone Age by the Vikings doing the same thing, you know, uh, a, few th a thousand years later. It's just interesting how all that works out. Well, let's take a look at verse 8. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed, anathema there, beyond the one, contrary to. Uh, if the God, <laughs> you know, if it's more than the Bible, it's too much. If it's less than the Bible, it's not enough. Remember we made the comment last week about... Uh, 
An angel, apparently, uh, is what Joseph Smith said, uh, appeared unto him and uh, helped him find the Book of Mormon and translate it and so forth, and that's how he got it. Well, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel or any other doctrine, what's, what's that tell us? That's something the angel obviously was wrong, uh, although you know as well as I do, uh, that was basically the... Uh, Somebody came up with that in their own mind. Notice uh, we have there 1 Corinthians 16, 22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema marantha, marant, maranatha. That's the idea accursed. It means something that's yielded up to the wrath of God. Uh, why such a strong curse? Well, if the law was still in force as the way of salvation, the Messiah uh, had not come. You know, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with, he was popular a few years back. His name was William F. Buckley, and uh, he's a Roman Catholic. He'd tell you straight up, you know, Pope's the man. Uh, but uh, there was the bishop in America, I think he lives in Chicago or something, whoever's over all the churches in North America, he basically put out an edict or whatever they do that they needed to quit worrying about, uh, you know, evangelizing Jews, because they lived under another covenant. Well, Buckley didn't play with that at all. He said, what, in the, what are you talking about? He says, if that is true, then Christ died for nothing. Now, here's a Roman Catholic, but a well-read uh, Roman Catholic, writing up in the, his, <laughs> you know, he, he ran a nationally syndicated column, uh, the Catholic uh, bishop uh, saying, you can't have it both ways. And uh, I appreciated him doing that. Uh, you might not agree, and I certainly didn't agree with his uh, theology, but the man was, he, he made people be consistent. He wrote a book uh, talking about God at Yale, and his whole point was there was no God at Yale anymore. They were teaching modernism, and I'm talking, this is in the 50s. And so it's just gotten worse since then. Notice verse 9. As we said before, we're repeating ourselves, and it's in the perfect tense. It denotes action completed. They've already been told this. This is not the first time these brethren have heard this. So say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than ye have received, let him be accursed. So say now I again, para lambano. You've received for yourselves. You've approached, uh, appropriated for yourself. He says, now notice in verse 10. Let's go ahead and read that together and put the whole verse together. For do I now persuade men or God? Well, you know, that's a, uh, a question that gospel preachers have to ask themselves. What's more important, to please God or to please men? Because sometimes you'll find yourself in a situation. And brethren, we're not ignorant uh, in regards to this. Years ago, I attended a congregation that was a divorce and remarriage haven. And you know what they were able to find? Preachers who would preach that. They would tickle the ear. They would not say that, uh, you know, a person in an adulterous relationship needed to get out of that relationship. And so they were able to find men who would say that very thing. And I can give you all the specifics you ever wanted. One of the reasons I didn't even know where Greens Lake Road was, the church, I knew my cousins lived up here, but I never didn't know where this building was. But I did know that the Greens Lake, Jim Lewis, the Greens Lake Road congregation was kind enough, and I mean this, kind enough to send out a letter and tell people, you know, what was going on at this place that I was attending. And uh, I knew something was amiss. Of course, I was young, and it didn't, uh, you know, I was in my 20s, and I just knew nobody wanted to play with us. You ever do that as a kid? You go to the playground, and they're all by yourself, and nobody will play with you. Uh, <laughs> that was how it was where I was attending. We didn't get announcements, you know, nobody was saying we're, and so I knew that we were being ostracized for some reason, but, you know, at one point I just didn't really care. Then later on I started thinking, well, what's this all about? And, you know, like a long story short, Jim Lewis was kind enough to teach a class right here, a subclass from Tennessee Bible College. He don't even remember it, but I remember it because he, uh, he made us do a whole lot of reading, let me tell you there. Uh, what's that? Dolan Hicks? 
Was that the name? Yeah. Yeah, he uh, stopped and I didn't know the man from Adam. Wouldn't have known. But it was kind enough, Jim was kind enough to have that extension course here and I learned the truth and that's when I knew that, you know, I needed to have a meeting with the elders, one of which was living in adultery. And, uh, you know, you can imagine how that went. We left, came here, and uh, the rest is history. But uh, he says, for I now persuade men. We're not here to serve men. We need to be faithful to the gospel, not what men want to hear. We're not here to tickle ears. Many are. He says, for, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Persuade, to induce by words to believe. You know, you've got some men out there uh, that'll teach you just about anything. And they're very good public orators. Joel Osteen didn't become a millionaire, uh, you know, by not being able to persuade people with uh, his uh, oratory. That uh, wonderful hair he's got and that big smile that he always has. You know, I'm just always like, man, alive. Uh, but anyway, this, notice this is an if-then statement. You cannot be a man-pleaser and a servant of Christ. Notice he talks about a servant, a doulos, a slave, a bondman. A slave doesn't do whatever he wants to. He does what his master, and we have a master, of course. Verse 11, but I certify you. The word there is norizo. It means to make known. I want you, brethren, to know. So now he's going to plead his case, if you will. And uh, before we get going too much further than that, look at your, uh, your outline of Galatians. Should have been the first part of that. Do you see uh, it's the one It's just three points, about half a page? It's from Tyndale Commentary. Do you, do you see that? Let's look at that real quick. Major point number one, first two, two chapters, the argument from history. We have the greeting, verses 1 through 5. We have the letter, uh, the subject being introduced. There's problems in Galatia, and Paul is going to deal with them. And, uh, you know, he doesn't kind of like some of his letters. He sort of says, boy, you guys are doing great. Everybody's talking about how wonderful you are and everything. He kind of gets after the Galatians pretty tough right off the bat. And so now notice that we're in the section that's called Paul's conversion. This is going to be from verse 10 through the end of this chapter, okay? And so that's what we're going to be talking about now. He's going to be given some evidences, just like the whole book of 2 Corinthians, save chapters 8 and 9. He's going to be giving you a, a, a defense for himself, but it's going to be a lot smaller, you know, than, of course, the, the 2 Corinthian letter. So he says, I certify you, brethren, I'm telling you the truth, that the good news, the gospel, which was preached to me, is not after men. He said, I, I didn't get this from men. So he's going to establish how that is so. Verse 12, For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, unlike us, who have to have someone teach us the gospel to get to know the truth, Paul didn't have a man teach him. He, remember, he was one born out of due season. Paul met Jesus. Do you remember when that took place, where that was? Acts what chapter? Acts chapter 9, he's on the road to Damascus, right? And the bright light, and he can't see. And, you know, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. Sorry for thee to kick against the pricks. Well, he says, I didn't get it from any man. And he says, I wasn't taught it. But by apocalypsis, or apocalypsis, we you know, we say, the revelation, an opening, if you will, Jesus is the one that gave this revelation. Neither at the hand of man, notice, not by Jesus being revealed to me, but I received the gospel by Jesus Christ revealing it to me. And that's from Vincent's word study. From henceforth, I think, I'll have to, as I go through, I'm trying to correct some things in these notes that I've had for years. They'll be, it'll be VWS. Vincent word studies, Robertson's word pictures. Uh, those are two... Uh, Greek uh, commentaries that uh, straight up most of the time they're pretty solid okay now when you get to certain passages like Acts 238 you'll see uh, A.T. Robertson Archibald kind of uh, <laughs> beat around the bush and try to argue things about that but for the most part these guys their scholarship is, is right on and so uh, Notice uh, the subject reveal. We said that. Notice this quote here by Kramer says of Apocalypto. The word serves especially in the New Testament to denote the act of divine 
revelation. It's when God is revealing something to you. Uh, and uh, he notes the apocalypse is rare in secular Greek. In the New Testament is applied exclusively to disclosures and communication proceeding from God or Christ of ob objects of Christian faith. And that's from Earl. Uh, and I guess I gave you his full name. There's a, he has a book. Um, nah. I can see the book. It's purple or pink. Mine's a pink copy. Uh, Ralph Earl, there we go, Word Meanings in the New Testament, that's on page 9, if you will, Ralph Earl. If uh, sometimes you can get a good deal on CBD or don't don't tell, uh, is that right, Christian books, description. you know, nowadays when I say an acronym like that, I almost thought I was telling you to go buy some weed somewhere. What is that, CDB, right? Isn't that, what do they call that? What is it, CBD? Isn't that what Christian books distributors is? Isn't that? Whoo, man, they might need to change their acronym, huh? Well, anyway, sometimes you can get a good deal, though, on word meanings of the Old Testament and word meanings of the New Testament. You can get, like, both of them for 20, and they're, they're really good works. Uh, I, highly rec I highly recommend them. They're simple, and, and I need simple. Uh, and so that's where that, that quote came from. Verse 13, For you have heard of my conversation. That word conversation, and you have it down there, is anastrophe. It means manner of life, conduct, and I do not mind one bit that the King James translates that word conversation. When they did that, it meant your manner of life. But that gives me an opportunity to stop and to stress that. That's one of the reasons I like the original languages, because you will stop when you're breaking down the verbs and, and, and uh, subjects and you're looking at articles and so forth. You're trying to put together the sentence. You stop and you start looking at every single word and this gives me an opportunity as well as you well what does this word mean well it's how you behave your conversation what makes that up and so I don't mind that a bit in fact I love stopping for a moment and just talking about a word that uh, you know has these meanings because it's how we live you know you've heard and Paul says you've heard how I live in times past in the Jews religion how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and laid it waste. Uh, just wasted it. The Jews' religion, uh, Eodeismos, uh, Jesus' name, remember we says Iesus. Uh, I don't know how the J came into bout, had something to do with the German. You know, that's one class I always wanted to take, but the man who taught that, I don't know if they offer that anymore at the Bible college where I go and went. Uh, James McGill, though, he was, uh, he was fluent in German. You know, brethren, that that's goes to show you something that's a lot different now than it used to be. When the brethren used to would send out a missionary, they spent, <laughs> Brother McGill went to, I forget how long, it was like a year or two years, just to learn the ger German language before he went overseas to try to work with the brethren over there and help establish churches and stuff. And nowadays, uh, we just don't seem to have the same, I don't know, emphasis and uh, are willing to go long term into some mission fields. It's kind of like we want to take a plane trip, come back in two weeks and say, man, we built 15 buildings, baptized 200,000 people, and everything's great. Uh, but, you know, probably could do a little bit better with that. And, you know, that's why we're having this class. We can point people in directions and hopefully encourage people to uh, become teachers and want to go to places and teach the gospel. Because there's a whole lot of places in the world right now that sure could use it, right? Including right here in Chattanooga. But notice this, beyond measure, it's hyperbole. It means to go beyond, a throwing beyond. We think of the word hyperbole as we talk about Jesus, if thy right hand uh, uh, offend thee, cut it off, you know. Uh, he's not really telling you to do that. It's an exaggerated thing, trying to stress a point. And so we use that word a lot. But here, this is the actual word in the Greek. Uh, and it's, uh, he's talking about beyond measure, over and beyond. I persecuted the church. And he's there. You know, they lay Stephen's, I mean, they lay their garments at his feet at the end of Acts chapter 7 as they um, stone Stephen to death. Uh, he gets letters to go into other places to persecute the church. And he wasted it. Uh, just, you know, going to destroy it. Notice verse 14 and profited in the Jews' religion. So let's take a look real quick at uh, Philippians chapter 3. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 3. You have that written there. 
And I kind of call this Paul's resume. He, he does this a couple of times. He does this in the Second Corinthian letter as well. But notice what he says. He says in, in Galatians here, he says, I profit in the Jews' religion above many mine equals in mine own nation. What's he mean by that? Well, in Philippians 3 verse 4, he says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I'm more. He'll say in the Corinthian letter, you know, you want to speak foolish? Okay, I'll speak about foolish. My chest bigger than your chest. I can bench press more than you can. My daddy can whoop your daddy. He says, if we're going to regress to that, then let's talk smack, okay? You guys are Jews. Big whoop. I'm a Jew. I'm a, you know, Hebrew of Hebrews is the, is the idea there. He says, circumcised the eighth day, stock of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, the first king. Hebrew of Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee concerning zeal. Persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. And so he says, you know, you're not just messing with anybody here. I've sat at the feet of Gamaliel. I have letters. I have studied. And so uh, here are these Jews, because you know that's what they were saying. And you can read that in this letter. You'll read it because he's going to talk about the, the pillars and so forth here in a minute. But in the Corinthian letter, these folks are coming from Jerusalem. And they're saying, well, you know, that's Paul. And he's kind of out here on his own. But listen. We came from the head shed, and we go where the big dogs are, and they say that you need to be doing this. And that's what's going to you know, pull this whole thing together, that we have to go to the Acts 15 and have this discussion where we say, you know, let's put this puppy to bed, if you will. And so he says, that, that's, that's just a quick resume. We've got a Romans 11, 1 there too. says, I say then, God hath cast away his people. God forbid, I'm also an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, tribe of Benjamin. So... He had those credentials just as well. And notice this procopto, to beat forward, to lengthen. I reached forward. I was driving forward. Uh, Earl, Ralph Earl says this figure of reaching forward is like a runner in a race, cutting ahead of others. Paul was so way out in front, he was already a leader as a young man now. Uh, he was on the track. He was on the track for the Sanhedrin. He'd have been on the track to have taught in their schools. You know, he was something. And he was Zelotes, you know, he was zealous, one burning with zeal. Uh, he was fanatic, if you will. I mean, any man that will mount up his bayonets and charge and go kill other men in the name of his God, that's a, that's a pretty zealous fella. And so, and notice what he says, the traditions, the paradosis, a giving over to which is done by word of mouth. You know, one of the things that I like, of, <laughs> I think, I have a really weird sense of humor. If y'all like Far Side, then you know that's about how I roll. That's my the kind of, of humor. But um, this idea of uh, word or mouth, they had a thing called the oral tradition. Well, they wrote it down, and it's called the Mishnah now. And I always thought that was funny because it's what? The oral tradition, but now you can get a, a book about it. You know, is that an oral tradition? It's no longer, is it? There was a young freshman uh, on UTC softball team, and they had just gotten beat pretty bad. And they were coming back in a bus, and, and she was back in the back of the bus cutting up. And so one of the seniors got up and went back there and said, Look here, when we lose a game, we don't clown around. We don't even talk on the way back. She says, Man, she said, I had no idea. The girl said, It's an unwritten rule. And I kid you not, the little freshman said, well, can I get a copy of those? You know, that's the whole idea. So, it, oral tradition. Jesus battled this. Do you remember when they asked his disciples as they were going through the fields, why are they pulling this up here, this grain, and, and eating it, doing that which is contrary to the traditions of the elders? What did Jesus say about that? You break the commandments of God by your traditions. You see, they had elevated this Mishnah, which wasn't written yet, but their oral tradition was above the things they should have been doing following the commandments of God. Honor thy father and mother. But they could say, nope, can't feed my mom and daddy or pay the rent. I've got to give this to the temple. And they could just stick a word korban on it. And they felt as though they were justified. And God's, Jesus said, you're breaking the commandments of God by your traditions. And here are the same thing. Paul is following those traditions, and uh, he would say, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I, I knew all of that and was doing all that. But verse 15, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace. 
Paul was a chosen vessel, if you will. And there was something special about Paul. Do you remember? Let's, let's turn over to Acts. Uh, what is that? Acts 9. Let's take a look at Acts 9. I'm shooting from the hip here, so if I... Well, good deal. That's probably right where we want to go. Yeah, that's exactly right. <clears throat> so Ananias says, Lord, are you sure you want me to go preach to this fellow? I mean, he's been really giving us down the road. Uh, he has done thy saints at Jerusalem much harm, verse 13. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Now this is Acts 9, now verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. Well, that's great. But what's happening? What's going to happen? To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Well, that's great, but notice it ain't over. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Yeah, Paul was zealous. Paul was one to go and would execute people or at least, uh, you know, gave his vote towards such. But he was going to have to go through some very, very tough things. And all of us know we can go to Second Corinthians and we can read the, the hit list of all the things that he went to, went through. Basically chased all over Europe as far as he went. Who's chased him, remember? It's these dudes. Yes, these Judaizing teachers. This is just not a war of words. These guys know how to, what was that old song, let's get physical, that's uh, what they would do. And they would kill him, tried to kill him. And you know, you, you want to see the fickleness of people in that same instance, you've got folks who think, man, Paul and Barnabas are gods, let's offer a sacrifice. And within the three verses, you know, they're, they're killing them. Uh, that's just how people will turn so quickly. Just not much emphasis. But notice, uh, call me by his grace. Um, now, a lot of people would look at this and say, this is predestination. I'm starting a class tomorrow that I want to tell you I'm about as excited as that wall right there. But uh, I've had uh, history of theology, which you had to read a lot of Calvin, but this time I'm taking the critique of Calvinism. And uh, John Calvin would look you dead in the eye and tell you, listen, if you think that you have any choice in this matter, oh, you're just full of blue mud. It's, but before God created this thing, He knew who was going to be saved, who was going to be lost, and He makes it so. And if you were part of the lost before the creation, you couldn't buy a ticket to heaven if you wanted to. If you were a part of the saved, you couldn't go to hell if you wanted to. And so some people think that that's the idea of being predestinated. Uh, that uh, I was predestinated for the world to be saved. Well, now God knows the beginning from the end, but there's some things that I have to do along the way, and I have the choice. See, Calvin would just take all the choice right out of it. One of the things I appreciate, it, and I have a copy of this. If you'd like it, I could probably find it. It's a copy by a, a preacher, a Baptist preacher, named Sam Morris in Texas. And, I, and the reason I liked it so much was he articulated what it meant to be once saved, always saved. And he'd tell you straight up, doesn't matter how many church services you attend, doesn't matter how faithful you are to Jesus, doesn't matter anything that you do. On the flip side, doesn't matter how many people you kill, how many people you rape, how much you steal, none of that. It contributes not one whit to your salvation. I think that's exactly why Rubel used that exact quote when he wrote up his, uh, uh, what was it, I'll be at Mont Fry, article years ago right up here in Nashville because you'll remember all bit Mont Fry was written on the gate as you went into Auschwitz and you, in German that meant works make free in other words you work hard enough we're going to let you go and he says that's what members of the Lord's church uh, believe that it's all about what we do and nothing about the grace of God and it was wrong when he said it then and it's wrong now but you know when he said that and there was so much emphasis when I first started preaching. That was the sugar stick, man. Grace and grace alone. And so we're, I'm like, whew, man. Because they said things like, look back at all your sermon outlines. Look back at all the restoration preachers and look at how, how much they preached on grace. They didn't preach on grace. You won't find those sermons. And then all it took was a fellow that had enough sense like Buster Dobbs to point out how many times do you read Jesus preaching on the subject of grace. 
How many? None. What does every word that came out of his mouth, though, what was it? It was grace. Grace is God's gift to man. We have to accept that. Calvin would take that out, and boy, we've got brethren that want to do the same thing. At least I'm glad that is not emphasized as much as it was in the past. Not predestinated to beyond your will, but something that a group of folks, if you predestinated those who would obey the gospel, uh, would be saved. Not individual people written down somewhere that can't change their destiny. Notice uh, uh, verse 16. Any, any questions, any comments on that? Verse 16, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Now the word heathen there, we use that uh, as a derogatory term, don't you? That's my daughter calling me because I didn't have enough sense to... Uh... Hey, Caitlin, I just want to introduce you to the class here at Greens Lake Road. They're looking very forward to, you know, after that Sammy Hagar song. I'll call you back, okay? Okay, there we go. Anyway... Uh... If you have your cell phones, be sure and silence them. Before. <laughs> I apologize. And that's Sammy Hager. I can't drive 55 because she got a ticket like when she was 17 or 18. And I have not let her live it down to this day. Okay? She's 35. But that's beside the point. All right. What's that? Is that right for talking on the phone? when Boy, I tell you what. Uh, that's some tough rules around here. Where was I? 16, to reveal his son, oh, the word ethnos. We kind of use heathen as like somebody to call you in the middle of a class. They must be heathen, right? But that just meant everybody that wasn't a Jew, okay? Ethnos, it's not a derogatory term in so much as it just meant you had the eodeos, you know, the Jews, and you got the ethnos. The, the, the uh, Hellenists uh, is one of the words they would use for Greeks, but it was not. In the Old Testament, you and I would be goys, okay? And that just meant folks that weren't the children of Israel. So uh, that I might preach among the heathen. And that's exactly what Acts 9 said, wasn't it? That I'm going to send him. He's going to be preaching to folks. He's going to be preaching to the Gentiles. Uh, well, I had that right there, didn't I? Uh, Should have paid attention to that. Verse 17. Well, first, okay, I'm sorry. That I might preach among the heathen. Immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. In other words, I didn't go ask some man. Okay, what's some good sermon topics here that I can hit? Can you give me some outlines or something? No. He says, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia. Now, uh, you've got a map. It's a few pages over uh, on page 15 in mine. I'm not sure. Hopefully, that's what it is with yours. But do you see that circle? This would probably be, mm, what, B between 4 and 5 there? B, uh, north and south, and between 4 or 5, east and west. See that circle around Antioch? If you'll drop straight down, go through Jerusalem and stuff, you'll see that Arabia? Now, it extends quite a ways out. That's where Paul went. He didn't go to Jerusalem. He went to Arabia. Wouldn't you like to know a whole lot more about what he did while he was there? I would. But that's where he goes. Paul says, I didn't go to uh, Jerusalem to the apostles, but I went into Arabia and returned again into Damascus. As notice we have a few notes there upon conversion. Paul did not go to Jerusalem. Uh, Arabia, we know almost nothing of this sojourn. Arabia is probably near the Sinai Peninsula. And in Galatians 4.25, uh, notice what it says. Let's flip over there real quick. Anybody beats me there, you can go ahead and read it. Four, verse 25, you better hurry, I'm there, man. For this, Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. So, we know exactly where Mount Sinai is, right? In that little peninsula. So, uh, the thing that sticks out there between the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba, I believe it is. Uh, anyway, that's, that's where it is. So, we know that he didn't go to Jerusalem. He's further south and uh, further east. And so back to when he started, his first recorded ministry, chapter 9, verse 20 of Acts. Notice verse 18, Then after three years he makes a trip to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him for two weeks, 15 days. And so he throws us in there. It's a short visit. He didn't go to get uh, preaching school or anything of that nature. He went to visit Peter. It says, uh, 
uh, Acts 9 verses 26 through 30 uh, tells of this trip. Barnabas, Barnabas was very instrumental in getting the brethren to accept Paul. Because why? what do people think of when they hear Paul, especially Christians in Jerusalem in Acts 9? Absolutely. We don't want this guy to come in here and see where we live and uh, how we meet and so forth. He, he could kill us. And so that's he meets Peter there. But other of the apostles, he said, I didn't see anybody. Save James, the Lord's brother. Then that's not saying that James was an apostle. But it also kind of gives us a timeline there too. James uh, is the, the brother of Jesus, wrote the book of James. Uh, and this notice is not written to discredit the other apostles, but stresses the fact that, he was, that his doctrine was not by the other apostles. Now, uh, do y'all have Galatians 13, page 13, the three men in the Bible named James? Did that make y'all's notes? I think y'all's may be a little different than mine. Do you see that? Three men in James. James, son of Zebedee. James, son of Alphaeus. James, the Lord's brother. It's there. Okay, good deal. You notice the print gets small because I was trying to keep everything. Uh, this is a quote from Boatman who does the Bible study textbook series. Now, that's from College Press and normally wouldn't recommend too much that comes out of there. However, these are pretty old. They're 50s and 60s. And so there's some good study material there as about these because that gives some people some grief trying to figure out which one of these visits is being spoken of. So you got three different Jameses. You've got James, the son of Zebedee. You've got James, the son of Alphaeus. And then you've got James, the Lord's brother. Now, the reason I think a lot of people, a lot of your commentators and so forth, don't want to say that this is James, the Lord's brothers, because they want to teach you that James, that the Lord didn't have any brothers. You have so much uh, theology out there that was written by Catholics, and they want to tell you that Mary never, Mary had perpetual virginity. That means she never knew her husband, Joseph. And the Bible doesn't teach that. As a matter of fact, James is one of Jesus' fleshly brothers, and so they try to make a play on the word there and say, well, this is really cousins, when they're just trying to keep this fantasy they have about Mary being a, a god, and Mary is not a god. And Mary would not want your worship. Isn't that amazing? That just really uh, shines a bad light. I mean, not on her, but that, that you know people would think, well, she would accept that because, uh, of course, she would not. Um, and James is uh, not an apostle in the sense that he has authority of the apostles or can bestow gifts and things of that nature. Barnabas is also referred to as an apostle. And Jesus himself is referred to, an apostle, is referred to as an apostle in, in the book of Hebrews. Uh, that just simply means, words always mean something according to their context. Now when it refers to Barnabas being an apostle, it just simply means he's one that went. Uh, Jesus being an apostle, he wasn't an apostle in the sense of the the 12 that we think about. Uh, it's like the, the word elder. Sometimes the word elder just talks about old people, older, fi older folks. But there is an office of an elder, and that's where the Bible takes a word that's normally used as, uh, you know, it's meaning somebody's older, and makes something, you know, more than that out of it. Uh, it's an office, and you qualifications for it and so forth. And so words always mean something, but it's what it means in its context, okay? And so the idea of an apostle there, he's not saying James was an apostle and probably spending too much time on that. Let's uh, go on down here to uh, verse 20. Uh, there's a lot of reading there. I encourage you. I spent a lot of time with that. There's also an excellent article on that E.M.E. construction in the pulpit commentary. Pulpit commentary, I know not too many people, uh, you know, it's, they're huge. But man, is it a wealth of uh, information. Now, they're off on some things, but they're, they're conservative, and they have great outlines in the back, and uh, you can get it free on eSword now, and it's searchable. It's just it's cheating uh, from when I used to just have the, the old copies. But they have a good article on that if you'd like to try to, to read that sometime. Verse 20. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. This is an oath, same as he does in Romans 9, 1. To, he wants them to know that I'm not making this up. This is serious business. And um, I want you to know that I'm not being false here. 
Uh, Jesus condemns swearing. He says, let your yea be yea and your nay, nay. But the swearing he's talking about there is not like taking an oath before a court where you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth. What he's talking about there, the Jews had turned swearing into an art form. And they would just swear about anything. Boy, I, I swear that cup right there, you know, on my children, I swear that cup's half full. And, I mean, just ridiculous, and, and that's what's being condemned there, because, uh, you know, I adjure thee. You remember the high priest does that with Jesus, and Jesus answers him at, at that point. Uh, so, you know, sometimes we can, you know, we, we look at a verse like, Judge not, that you be not judged. People just get hung up on that. Well, can't you see that right there? It says, Judge not. If they'll just keep on reading, though, they'll see that that's qualified because we make judgments every day about many things. Same thing here. Verse 21. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Uh, we get our word regions there. We get our word climate from that Greek word. And so he came into that area. You have the map there. I hope you, uh, I wish yours was in color. Uh, it, it makes it so much easier to see, at least to me. And then in verse 22, and was unknown by faith unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. Still unknown, literally. By faith, you know, uh, look at me. They didn't know what I, who I was or uh, they wouldn't have been able to pick me out of a lineup, if you will. Uh, made a play there on ecclesia and synagogue. Uh, some people have tried to say that this was uh, synagogues and that's not, you know, what's being spoken of here. These are the called out ones. These are Christians that he's talking about here. Uh, verse 23, But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which he once destroyed. So this is our first trip, if you will. Uh, and notice in verse 24, And they glorified God in me. That had to be spectacular, right? Here's a guy who was the number one hit man, if you will, for Judaism, and yet now he's one of us. What a great uh, testament. And uh, had to make the, the brethren there just so much more uh, sure of their uh, uh, what's going on in the Christianity and so forth. So what have we seen in Paul's offense? First of all, he makes ten assertions. I didn't get this from a man. Didn't receive it from a man. I wasn't taught it. It came by revelation from whom Jesus, separated from my mother's womb, called through grace, conferred not with flesh and blood. Just really emphasizing the first three again. Neither when I went up to Jerusalem, I didn't know where I went and studied. Other the apostles saw I none, and I'm not making this up. Those are the facts, and we can make the judgments. Let's drive right on in to chapter 2 now. Paul's gospel and apostleship confirmed and maintained. Uh, that's some introductory material there, but let's go ahead and dive into the passage. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and took Titus with me also. Uh, this could be the time from Paul's first visit. A lot of folks believe that it's talking about from the time of his conversion. Both times have been held by well-studied individuals. If I was you, you can spend some time perusing that, but I wouldn't beat myself up over it because some, there's been some good arguments, uh, you know, on uh, both sides of it. I kind of like the latter view myself. Went up, you know, he's going up in elevation. And this is just one of those many areas, and I know you've heard this before, but it doesn't ever hurt to emphasize that when we think up, we think north, and we think down, we think south. But that's not, you know, <laughs> that's not how in biblical times, and it's not even if you go out west in some places, you know, you're talking about up. Elevation, 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 it's everything. Like tonight, if you go across Montego, what might you see? Might see some white stuff, mind you, but down here you probably ain't gonna see nothing but a little bit of rain. But that's significant when you're talking about three, four, five thousand feet of elevation, and uh, so and plus you've got a wagon and an animal and so forth, and you're trying to walk it. But anyway, it's just uh, the way we use language. Okay, um, here we see God's ears. That's just an anthropomorphism. What does that mean? Anthropo. Man, morphism, the form of. God has done that, does that to, uh, you know, visit man. Uh, you know, he wouldn't want to be looking like some alien or something. So uh, that's a, the Bible speaks to us in ways like that to bring it down to our level, if you will. 
Notice uh, Acts 15. Um, well, I'll tell you what, we need to back up from that. There was another visit, Acts 11.30 through 12.25, not, not mentioned here by the apostle. That's not his point. He's not giving you a history of everything he did. But he's, he's hitting the points of what he's telling them. He says, many have tried to look at this as a discrepancy, but Paul does not say it's his second visit. He rather says, this is what happened on this particular visit. The first visit was to see Peter. It only lasted 15 days. Second visit, not mentioned in the Galatian letter, was for benevolent purposes. The third visit here and in chapter 2 is elaborated by Luke in Acts chapter 15. So let's don't beat around the bush no more. Let's go ahead and knock that out. And that's probably about all we're going to get done, isn't it? Uh, that's what this is going to be talking about. Let's turn to Acts 15. We'll just read the first couple of uh, verses. It says, And certain men which came down from Judea, remember now we're in Antioch of Syria, which is north, but coming down in elevation, and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. This is the, the issue, this Judaizing teaching, saying that you've got to bring this Old Testament with you. Brethren, that's... Uh, let's go ahead and read this, and then we'll just close with this. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And they're going to do that and then Peter's going to stand up. Paul and Barnabas are going to give their side. They're going to tell about the things that they've done. Then James is going to speak. They're going to write a letter and send it out. But when I grew up in denominational era, we would tell you straight up things like, you'd be saved just like Abraham was saved. You just got to trust God. And things like baptism and all that other stuff. Look, that's things you do. But see, you're thinking you're, when it's all part of Calvinism, it's carried over. You're thinking you're doing something. It's not you. It's all about God. Well, nobody's denying that God has put this scheme of redemption in motion. But what we didn't understand, I didn't understand, was the difference in the covenants. Alexander the Campbell, one of the things that... I said Alexander the Campbell, didn't I? <laughs> Alexander Campbell, one of the things that he did... He started the Church of Christ. No, he didn't. Uh, it was doing quite well before he allowed it. But Rocky, uh, Rocky, Rock Springs... Uh, Rocky Springs in uh, 1807 years before Alexander Campbell set foot in America they were already meeting right over there in Bridgeport Alabama but the, one of the things he did he debated these uh, these folks and was talking about this new covenant and that was just news to people they uh, the Puritans when they landed in America they would hunt witches and everything they were uh, they'd keep the old law I mean that they they saw no difference from binding what's written in Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus than binding what's written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They just weren't about covenant. They didn't see the difference. And so that was big news for me. Uh, and then when you learn things like that, that's, brethren, that's one of the reasons the denominational world don't have a problem with instrumental music. They can get over to Psalms 150 and just get all excited about it. Woo, there it is, man. We got it right here in the Old Covenant. Not so. We're not under the old covenant, but they do not understand that. They think you can be saved just like Abraham was saved. All you got to do is trust God. It's all one book, right? 66 books. No. Jesus died for the new covenant. A new will. The old law has been removed. You can't be married to two laws at the same time. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. You have to, one has to be put away. And that's exactly what Colossians 2.14 says. That's exactly what the book of Hebrews teaches. Because there's a new priesthood, there had to be change also of the law. And so uh, that's, that was but what I want you to see from that. That was a novel concept, but our denominational friends today are not the first ones to wrestle with that. They were wrestling this right out of the chute. We're uh, still in the first century. The apostles are roaming around, and guess what? We're having problems getting rid, allowing the old covenant to be replaced with the new covenant. We want to keep certain people want to keep circumcision. They want to keep obedience to the old law, and you can't be married to two. And that's what Paul's point is. Just like Buckley writing up the bishop in Chicago, if if keeping the old law saves you, then Jesus died for nothing, and he's not the Messiah. So that that's the significance there. 
So, brethren, I certainly appreciate your uh, good uh, attention. Notice your assignments for next week. Appreciate your work. Appreciate you reading the book. I hope you're getting something from this. Uh, if you're not, don't tell me about it. You'd hurt my feelings. But anyway, uh, Brother Owen, would you be kind enough to dismiss us? Amen. Carla, how are things going in the haircutting world? Good deal.